<laughs> That's a fun crowd. I love actors in the audience. Seriously. We, really, we need to do this all the time. Thank you. A room full of extras. How do we go wrong with this? <laughs> Just kidding. Careful. Just kidding. Careful. Please. Touchy subject. Come on. Help me out, folks. We had him, Tim. We had him. <laughs> I lost him in the first second. Son of a gun. Hey, it's such a pleasure to be here tonight. Um, my name is Tim Thompson. I'm the founder, chief revolution thinker at RevThink. Uh, it's great to be here. When I imagined, you know, 10 years ago, 11 years ago when I started my consultancy, I imagined moments where I could just say something and people would believe me. And uh, really, you proved to be true in the first session. So thank you all for believing what we, what we said. There's an opportunity in what we know and learn that we, our idea here is to start the conversation that you finish yourself. Um, what we know is in this industry, it takes a village. And when you develop community and networking and people, those are the people that in the future you begin to collaborate with. So at RevThink, we believe the best way to deal with the future is to create it. And here is the moment where your future begins. So I appreciate you all joining us. We love to escort, that, escort you into that opportunity. Um, is that the wrong thing? Yeah. Um, we're, for those in the tech booth, we're looking for a new f clicker. <laughs> we have Very no control. technical term that without it, I don't know what to do. <laughs> to, be clear, to be clear, Patrick, you're not looking for an extra clicker, right? A new clicker. <laughs> new clicker. It's a new clicker. That was bad. They're staying nappy. <laughs> <laughs> um, clearly, nappy is a great supporter of what we're doing here. The nappy conference and all that it provides in Miami is an opportunity in a marketplace to share your ideas, sell your ideas, and buy ideas. So when we conceived of this um, show launcher platform, what we wanted to do is prepare people for the Miami event. Um, that's why it's an event each quarter. And then it ends really in January at Miami when we take the stage again and start starting the, the reputation over again. <clears throat> but you are our audience. You are the people going to go um, to the event in Miami. And you are the, be the ones that are successful because we're teaching you all the secrets, right? Um, but we know why you're here. Uh, there, when, as you live out this creative career and you're making choices, it seems, especially in Los Angeles, it seems like the opportunities are just huge or common, right? We, um, we see the barista handing you a script with your, with your mocha, or uh, many of your roommates or friends might also be in this industry, and you hear these jobs, and often they're not the jobs when we got into this, uh, when we came to Los Angeles and got into this industry, we even knew existed. Um, for example, uh, in the 1990s, I worked for a motion design company and we did opening credits to films. I didn't even know that was a job, let alone could you make an entire career doing it. But when you do and you get involved with all these little niches, um, there's also a moment where those can be a distraction. Where the, moment you, the reason you came to Los Angeles and what these opportunities are giving you, they start pulling you away from those things that you actually wanted to do. Um, graduation season, Robert Frost is often quoted with the, the, um, the road not taken. Yeah, the road not taken. And uh, in, the, in the last stanza, he's talking about the roads that was less traveled. But what's interesting in that last stanza is it begins with the future. Someday in the future, I'm going to be telling you about these roads. And I took the one most traveled, and I hope these are my, this is my paraphrase. I hope to say it made all the difference. Um, I think that's the reason why we come to these events in this industry. We know that we are called to do something. There's a moment where we have to make decisions. There's all this uh, really noise happening in the industry telling us to go this way or try that way or, or, or meet up with these people or take this, take this opportunity. But in all those risks and moment and opportunity, um, uh, occasions that come upon you, we have to have some discernment. There has to be something inside of us that grows and say, that's the path I want to go. Are those are the people I know are going to make the difference. So the reason we're here tonight is to find those paths, to meet the experts like Patrick, 
um, to hear from his experience so that when those moments are coming to us, we know the right ones, the ones that make a difference, or those that are just distractions. They're close to what we want to do, but not really there. So let me introduce, introduce Patrick Jaeger to you. Hello. Patrick um, was a RevThink consultant for a little bit of time, not too long. Uh, his group, Core uh, Innovation Group, uh, focuses primarily on helping content makers and brands put their, put their package together and get it seen, put it on air. So that mixing and matching, that pitching and gaining and growing all kind of need some mechanisms, some coaching through it. And Patrick and the core innovation group, that's what they did until Patrick got discovered by NBC <laughs> Universal and got snatched away, hidden away in a, in a big tower in New York City for a little while. And he recently launched Blueprint, which is one of NBC Universal's latest uh, distribution channels for, the, for content. So Patrick, for the last six months, has been listening to pitches and pitches and pitches. So here tonight, as we talk about the pitch, know for sure this man knows what he's talking about <laughs> because he's been living it out. He'll tell you the ups and downs, the gains and losses that he's seen personally. So we're so thankful to have you here, Patrick. My pleasure. Can I just give people one quick, is this the, oh yeah. yeah. This is a mobile website. This is not an app, this is a mobile website. If you go to your web browser, and you go to that funny URL, it says RevThink, but the dot is right before the ink. Uh, you'll actually see some resources we have available, and our entire presentation tonight exists on that mobile site. So feel free to go there, click on the button along the bottom that says Resources, you'll see the, the presentation and you can just download it. I just want you to know that because as you're writing and taking photos and trying to capture all this, we just wanted to put that up there for you um, so you have that resource available. So now, session one recap, Patrick well, Jager. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> All right, so I loved seeing how many hands were here for session one. I'm also incredibly impressed how many people were not here. I'm gonna do a quick recap. Uh, I will do it in verse, not really. I'm just um, um, so my background, I've been in TV for a long time. Before I was in TV, I was a public, well, I was in marketing. Uh, and then I was in healthcare marketing, riveting. Then I was a publicist. Uh, and then I became a producer. And I told the backstory, but literally it was a, you should be a producer, and I was a producer. And I started winning awards, I was like, I'm pretty good at this. But when you talk about like the niches, I didn't train to sell, tele to make television. I didn't, like, this is, this is a, somewhat of a calling, some of it is a happenstance, but really it's I have a storytelling soul. And everybody in this room, doesn't matter where, if you're here through, sag after, or you're here through Nappy, or you're here because you're friends of ours, everyone in this room has a storytelling soul. And I think that's what we really want to do is, it's all about how do you take, where can you take that? And in a town where it's all about hierarchy, what kind of car you drive, what you do, what club you go to, you know, um, how hungover are you the next day from that <laughs> really amazing party? Like, that's the part of LA that I was so excited to move away from. Um, because, <laughs> because it's all about keeping up with the Joneses here. And, and I get it, I mean, it's an industry town. Um, but part of what we really talked about on the last session was the uh, fish the pocket, not the stream. You know, the stream is this crazy world we live in here in LA or in our industries or just in general. But everyone in here, what we love doing and why we do this, it actually gives me goosebumps. The reason we do this is because everybody ha should have the opportunity to fish the pocket. Find that sweet spot. To that end, as, as Dan said, we talked a lot at the end of last time about look to your left and look to your right. These are the people you should look at collaborating with because you're not at a point you can pitch a network. You're just not. If you haven't done it before, you can't just jump into a network. You can, most of you will not succeed. We, we did talk about the fact that there are some that do. But we talked about look to your left and look to your right. We went out, we were at Marie Callender's afterwards and, and looking at people and they were, they were hooking up. There was a group, I don't know if you're here, there was a group of people that, I don't know if it was the beer or what, but they were like in it. They were like, we were gonna meet on Thursday, we're gonna do this thing. And you know what, that's exactly right. And someone actually did exactly what we said, is you have to have IP. You have to have something that you're selling that is yours, that no one else can copy. And someone took that advice. So um, 
little of our background. Here were the big things we talked about. Understanding today's media landscape, normally there's a monitor so I don't have to turn around, so I hope you like this here. Um, <laughs> understanding today's media landscape, we talked a lot about how bifurcated and diversified it is. It's not five channels anymore, it's not 500 channels, it's 5,000 multiple times over channels of where content is distributed. We talked about kind of the inner workings of the fiefdoms of television networks. Um, we talked about the idea of he who pays owns. So you can have a great idea, but if you are lucky enough to sell it to Netflix, it's no longer your idea. It's Netflix's idea. Just like if you have something and you sell it to Sony as a scripted project, it's Sony's. So, um, you know, we talked a lot about that. We talked about reading the tea leaves, and this is really the idea of you have to, we're going to talk about the art of the pivot tonight. And the reading the tea leaves is what are people looking for? Don't go in saying, I'm going to do this show and it's about guys with long beards that make duck calls. Been done. It has? Duck Dynasty. <laughs> Darn it. Uh, my segue I have that, one with ladies that have big beards that make duck calls. In. <laughs> that has <laughs> not been done. <laughs> oh! I love it. Now, if you can hook up with three people here and make that joke. <laughs> and beards, um, apparently. <laughs> uh, and then we talked about uh, talent and IP, because that really, at the end of the day, is it. If you do not have something to sell that is unique, because there is no such thing as a new idea. I was pitched, I was at a, a company, Scout Entertainment, they do Queer Eye for the Straight Guy on Netflix. So I was at their offices today and they were pitching me some shows and they pitched me a show and I said, oh, you mean this one? And I handed it, I showed them a deck from another production company that was the exact same show with the exact same talent. Because the talent is, that's what they do. But they didn't, own, neither one of them signed that talent. They both just think it's a really cool idea with really cool talent. Well, guess what? Neither of you own that talent or the idea. So there's nothing stopping me, quite honestly, from going up to that talent and I do that idea as a network. Because it's not, you don't own that IP. So we talked a lot about this. It's really, so the first epi uh, episode, <laughs> everything's an episode. To me. <laughs> yeah, <right>. um, <laughs> so the first, our, our first uh, session was really all about understanding the market. If you don't understand the market, it's really hard for you to know how you navigate that market, right? So, oh, oh, I missed a, a slide. I do have a butt <laughs> statement. Uh, and what was the butt statement? Because I've seen to be, okay. But, <laughs> oh, this, just, ah, look, I'm there. See, I haven't monitored, I, I can't, I'm really, we're winging this tonight, so just <laughs> bear with us. We're much more fun when we just are yeah, like this. Right. Get us um, all the way us. So, what does it mean? It means it's not just about what you have, but how you pitch it, right? There is no real, no, so that's what tonight is about. Tonight is about how do you pitch something? How do you pitch yourself? Now, by the way, these are skills that, th th this helps sell a show, but it sells you. Everyone in this room, everyone in this room is selling themselves. And so uh, a lot of this is learning how to do, I mean, I, I really honestly think a lot of this is life stuff, to be honest with you. So tonight, it's all about perfecting the pitch. And there are five things we're gonna talk about. Elevator pitch, pitch deck. I'm gonna go back into some reverse engineering we talked about it, but that's kind of my secret sauce. So we're gonna bring it up tonight. Identifying branded opportunities, and then the old to sizzle or not to sizzle. Meaning, do you, can, is a pitch enough or do you have to show tape? Do you have to actually spend money before you make money? Um, so let's get into it. Crafting your elevator pitch. You only have one chance to make a first impression. You've all heard that. How many of you have worked on elevator pitches or log lines? Well, welcome. How many of you have been successful with that elevator pitch or log line? All right, that's awesome. So we've got some, so let's talk about what the elevator pitch or log line is. Um, all right, I'm gonna stay on that side. So uh, the elevator pitch is exactly that. If, if you only have four floors, you push the button and the guy you wanna see comes in, you only have four floors, how are you gonna talk to them? So when I was, uh, when I ran a, production company, and I had a development staff of about 20 people. Um, if they couldn't pitch it to me in a paragraph, they couldn't pitch it to me. I literally would not let them give me a pitch unless I could see physically that it was a paragraph. And, that I, and you had to be able to sell me in that. This is the problem I think most people have um, when you go into a room. And a lot of this is a confidence issue. 
People, when you aren't sure that you understand what it is you're selling, your IP, you meander. Yep. Because when in doubt, just keep talking. It's kind of what I'm doing right now. Um, so it is very, very, very important when you are, when you, once you've got, so you've gotten your idea, right? You've, you've got your talent, you've got your IP, you've done some research, you know how you want to do it. You need to be able to say that concisely. Because these people, myself included, are pitched a lot. And um, when you're pitched a lot, you know exactly when someone is successful by how long it is. Once it starts to go off or it starts to tangent, or it never has a period, just a lot of commas, <laughs> you've lost it. You, you really have. So I think the first and foremost thing you need to do when you are looking to come up with a, a, a project that you want to pitch. And this is also about how you pitch yourself as a collaborator. How, like, you better be able to sell yourself in a paragraph. What does that mean? It means you have to be able to say what it is, what the impact of that is, who it benefits, and why. Say that again. What it is, <clears throat> what the impact of that is, who it benefits, and why. So if you're coming to me as uh, in, as Blueprint. Blueprint's a digital arm of NBC Universal. It was a company called Craftsy, which was all about learning how to do a craft. And NBC bought Craftsy and wanted to turn it into a SVOD, a, a, a OTT platform, like a Hulu or a Netflix for people that want to learn and be creative. So they brought me on board to create this Netflix for doers. Um, still have a lot of series. I just launched eight new series and 20 classes this week in 25 different things. Um, so we're still pitched. I was pitched by four different production companies today and they, you know, and you know who does it well because they're like, okay, so here's the deal. This is a show, this is a show for writers that need to get, be unblocked by seeing how challenges in their lives affect them. By the way, it's not just for writers, it's about anyone that's creative and how to pull, uh, how to pull black the, back the blinders. Um, and if they get this, they will be committed to you for life as a network. I'm making that up a little bit, but you get the point. I now know who, who we're gonna talk about, I now know what the topic is, I know why it's important to me, and I'm ready to say, all right, show me your deck. So the term I like to use is addition by subtraction. Oh, that's good. So many people have these ideas and they're thought out and there's a lot of details, but in describing this pitch, it's removing all the stuff that's not relevant and getting right to the point. I actually have a friend named David Meltzer. Actually, I have a friend, but I... Oh, uh, that's nice. <laughs> I have a friend named David Meltzer and David's TV show is called Elevator Pitch. Mm -hmm. And uh, when he came up with the idea, a person stands inside an elevator, they have 40 seconds to pitch or 30 seconds to pitch their idea. And then if they win, it opens up and becomes a Shark Tank-like environment. Um, and as we're gonna get to later, the reason he came up with this idea is because he had an arrangement or agreement with Entrepreneur Magazine. And he had to think of a show that would meet their demographic. So when he had the idea, the elevator pitch became literally the elevator pitch as a show. But the idea that he can get down to a moment and try to teach people or, or make a TV show to teach people how to do that addition by subtraction. Get it down to the details. You'll see the winners, see the losers. And, and create engagement right away. And where, the, where, that, where that's cool from a television show, because some would say that's the worst, most boring show in the world, is you start to root for people. Like Absolutely. you are at home and going, oh, you're gonna get it. Or you're not, oh, they didn't get it? How did they get it? How did they get it? Yeah. Like it's, it's a great show. Now that's show I would watch. The proposal on ABC, <laughs> I think is the worst piece of trash I've ever seen in my life. If anyone is part of that, <laughs> I'm really, really sorry. You're in LA, Patrick, stop. <laughs> <laughs> Rival, rival networks. Um, that, is, that is a show. So this is what we talked about last time. We talked about the fact that some people are really lucky. You can come up with an awful idea and it gets on air. Just like you can be an awful actor and somehow you keep getting those roles. And you're like, son of a bitch. How does he I keep doing that? Well, the proposal is done by Mike Fleiss, who does The Bachelor. And the proposal is the time slot right after that. And he already had all the brands on board, so they gave him the slot. And it's the worst piece of television ever. And I think that is, but that's an example of people look at that and say, it's that easy. You can have the worst idea. No, it's Mike Fleiss. He can do whatever he wants. You're not Mike Fleiss. I am not Mike Fleiss. 
So we don't have that luxury of using that as our example. We need to think like your friend who is like, I'm gonna think of something smart that hasn't been done. I'm gonna fish the pocket, not the stream. I'm gonna look for that thing. So, all right, you've gotten in the door, you've done the elevator pitch, the door's open, oh, I'm, I, and I'm still with you. I'm ready to watch a deck. So how do you do a deck? I am the king of decks. I make a very, very good deck. I love making decks. I think decks is an art form. I like to just make books of decks. Um, because <laughs> Wait, a deck... I have a good idea we should make. <laughs> <laughs> um, because a deck is something where, like, I had to do a, I, I had to do a deck. I have a new project that's, um, I had to get it blessed all the way up to Bonnie, Ham Bonnie Hammer, who's the head of the uh, ABC Universal Cable Group. So I have to send Bonnie this deck, and I can't do it in person, so you can't read her vibes. So she's on the phone. Another thing that you guys are gonna have to know. And, and first thing she says, she goes, ooh, this is a good deck. <laughs> Appearance matters in this business. Appearance matters the way you go into anything you do. So everything we're talking about here, it takes time, right? Just like we talked about, it takes time to craft yourself, it takes time to craft your elevator pitch, it takes time to find that great idea, to find the right person. All that stuff takes time. Um, if you're rushing for a deadline, this is very important to me, if you're rushing for a deadline that is arbitrarily designed by you, you're rushing for the wrong thing. Yep. Too many of us think that that's the thing. I gotta get it to market right now, I gotta get it to market right now. Well, if you own the IP, no you don't. It's yours. If you own the talent, you know, and you've locked that up, you don't. And more importantly, it, no matter when you get there, there is no such thing as a new idea, so do it right the first time. Because chances are, if you do a bad deck, all they're gonna remember is, oh, that's that dude that did that deck, right? Yeah. We don't wanna do that no, guy again. we don't want that guy. No. So, so if you're using a template that comes with Keynote or PowerPoint, you already are out of the league. You have to know that first presentation, that first glance, glance that you're looking for. So do some research, hire a friend, take a class. Just know that you have to put on makeup before you go and pitch this thing. It has to be a real first impression. So, so you might say, well, how in the world am I gonna know that? Well, A, you can look it up. There are, you know, you can go online and say pitch deck and you can, you can look for examples. But I'll give you, I'm gonna go backwards here. This is a great example of thinking through a deck, right? We didn't just take a keynote slide and slap on a photo that was cropped wrong and had a w weird red bar around it because you, yeah. you didn't know how to space the bar. An like, Arial 10 or whatever. Right, right, right exactly. <laughs> Sorry. We, we found the photo we wanted. We put the right sepia tone on it. We made sure that we, you know, you think about composition. You think about how, if you look subtly, it's behind every slide. Like, these are the types of things. It sounds really silly. And you might say, but I don't know how to do that. But you definitely, this is what we talked about. Look to your left or your right. Someone you know does. Um, as you're going through and you, if for, for those of you that are here and you were like, I really don't know why I'm here now because none of this is making sense to me, I promise you we'll get it, we'll, we'll help you make <laughs> sense. But the, but the reality of what we're talking about is if you want to get into the business of selling your ideas as something else, creating something more than just saying, you know, I have this idea for a show and everyone's like, I know you've been talking about it for five years. Mm -hmm. If you want to get past that point, you have to, you have to do the work, right? We, we were talking before, and I'll just talk about it here. Um, at, I was an actor for a very long time, and you, know, you don't get to, I remember the first time I came to, like, I was really easy to be a big actor and get commercials and, and uh, you know, stage work and stuff in Denver. And then I came to LA and it was pilot season. I'm like, I'm gonna, oh, that's it. And you know, I got nothing. <laughs> and again, and again. And, and part of it was because you have to, you know, you have to crawl before you walk. You gotta walk before you run. You gotta run before you, you know, run a marathon. And some of the stuff we're talking about, you know, I'm, I'm a television guy. I've been doing this for a very long time. So I, I'm, my, my level is here, right? So I'm telling you stuff that's here. Just understand you take it back a notch. You're not gonna, you're probably not gonna pitch Netflix your first time you have a, an idea. First of all, you're not gonna find, like how are you gonna get to them? Again, you might, Mike flies in and have the right guy, but um, for most of us, that's not the case. 
You might, though, have a great idea that another production company would be interested in um, partnering with you on because you have a great idea and they have a great track record and they know how to make a deck. So you can learn from others. You don't have to, you're never, you're never as smart as, like, Lauren Michaels has a great thing. If, I'm the, if I go into a room and I'm the smartest person, I'm in the wrong room. <laughs> and I think there's something really about this. Like, none of you are experts. I am not an expert. We are all learning because we're winging it. There is no secret formula here. So look around at how, it, with everything we're talking about, you might not have that today, but that doesn't mean you don't grow to it. You might be pitching, you might be pitching a much smaller idea. Um, you might be pitching something where you want to get a brand, and we're going to talk about branded, a brand, a local brand to underwrite it. It's something you can do for, you know, you think you can probably get it done for $1,000 and you want to have a brand. So your pitch deck doesn't have to be, you know, as sophisticated if you're looking for small numbers. So let's talk about the requirements for deck. Let's talk about these. These are the six things I want to talk about with decks. So what are the basics for all decks? All decks need to be able to answer who, what, when, where, why, and how. Right? If you don't, if you can't answer that, I cannot tell you how many times people come in to pitch me. Like I got one today, uh, a really good friend of mine who uh, uh, is a minister and she does TED Talks and she's written you know, 25 books. So she's very smart. But she's like, I have an idea for a show. Here it is. And, she, and, and it's with uh, uh, two authors that have written a ton of books and they're all emailing me. And it's like six lines that are random. I'm like, I don't get it. Like, do you have a deck? No, we have words. Is this not enough? I'm like, no, this is not enough. You need to come to my thing tonight. And, um, <laughs> but, but I think this is the thing. People think that like an idea is enough. I was at, um, I was at BuzzFeed right before I came here and, um, which is a sister company of ours. And, um, a good friend of mine who heads production said that when she got in her job a couple months ago, there, there was a, a project that had been greenlit for several hundred thousand dollars that and, she, and it, all it said was comic game show and she asked people like well what's where's the deck on this what is this and they were like i don't know they had sold something called comic game show that was that was the sum total so it's a mike fleiss moment um, <laughs> so a, every deck needs to have be able to answer the questions what is it who's it for why is it important? How is it going to work? Um, and when can it be done? So start over. So who is the who? Who, what, when, where, why, how? Yeah, so who, who is? Who is the topic? Who is the IP, right? Okay. What are they going to be doing? So what, what are they? They being the who. Okay. So, uh, so let's, let's go with your beard. <laughs> Wait, who's on first? <laughs> I knew you were going to do that. I knew you were going to do that. We do get funny, just so you know. It does happen. Um, so let's 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 use a show that I created uh, a few years ago called Fixer Upper on HGTV. So pitch deck was very pretty, lots of pretty shiplap. Yeah, yeah, of and, course. <laughs> uh, and uh, who? Incredible couple in the middle of nowhere, Texas, that's literally changing their town one house at a time. That's so you the, say that that's the deck. That's the log line, yeah. right? Who? It's a beautiful couple. What are they going to do? Every episode, we will see them take a family and find the worst house and turn it into the best house. That's the, that's the what. When? It will take us, in, in, over the course of a one hour episode, we will see them buy the house, design the house, redo the house and show off the, the final house. So when is the timeline? Timeline of how long is this gonna be? Yep. Where? Waco, Texas, middle of nowhere. Isn't it gonna be fun? Why? Because we know that you are looking for the next Property Brothers, which means that they are relatives that are doing both design and construction and real estate. And to get it in a husband and wife with four adorable kids in a market where the cost of real estate means we can give you show-stopping results on no money. So we do this deck. So do that for me again, but yeah. this time do... Um, oh, I love this. Don't, uh, a non-reality show. Do something that is more long form or... Fictional narrative. Sure, fictional narrative. okay, fictional narrative. Uh, oh, this is a good one. 
picture a husband and wife, suburban, uh, that have always, that, that are, are the picture perfect couple of normalcy. Both of whom are hiding a secret. Both of whom are, are um, living a lie and destroying lives in the process. Both of whom are flawed characters uh, with award-winning angst. Bo both, both, of, both of whom um, have complexities that allow us to see into the lives of middle American couples today. I'm doing a bad job, but this is the Americans. Right? right? The, so idea is, the, idea, the idea is narrative is a little harder because narrative, at the end of the day, they want to see a script. So but you still have to have a deck. But still, the, the IP, the character, is the thing you want to control. Mm -hmm. Has a who to it, has a what to it. Uh, transformation, information, gain, loss, 100%. perfection of something. That's the what. Why? Why? Why do we care? Why do we at whatever network care? And you have to be able to say it in words that they understand. We talked last time about if you're going to go pitch someone, understand who they are, understand what it is they're looking for, understand. Um, why they're interested in this, and understand what they're not interested in. I would also say this, like I'm watching this TV show, Genius, the uh, National Geographic show, mm. and it takes place in the, when, the, when he's older and when he's younger. Um, in your first pitch, I wouldn't pitch something as complicated in trying to answer the when question, to try to say, well, there's gonna be some scenes when he's younger and some scenes when he's older. In your first pitch, you kind of might wanna make it more simple or make the storyline simple. That even if you have a larger idea, to get past, past that first pitch and talking about Picasso when he's younger and the, the, the decisions he has to come across, and then later on pitching it to more and more people, you can develop it right. as a good idea, but not all the complexity at the beginning. I, I, I say yes and no. So I have a script that I have out right now, and it's a script that's very near and dear to me. And um, I had sold a different version of the script years ago that it went into turn around and, and I finally got it back. And um, my producing partner had uh, decided to do uh, no deck, no log line, nothing that really set it up. He just was gonna hand it off the script. Well, A, no one wants to read a script. Um, then he, then I said, you, ha I mean, you have to have a pitch deck. You have to have a deck. Then he did a pitch deck. It was just literally like two pages of paper that looked exactly like a script, but it was just two pages. <laughs> and, we weren't, and we weren't getting any traction. How do you think? And our new one is I had a graphic designer design the, you know, design the pitch. I cut his voluminous text down to you know, one paragraph per page with a lot of beautiful space that you, like, you can read the words, you can look at the images, you can see the composition, you can look at the negative space and you can go, I get it. You almost wanna read it like, you, like you're reading a movie trailer. You I, get that same impression and same ideas with the words and the images inside I, of it. You can spend a lot of time drafting the perfect thing. I think that there is a, you know, there's a 12 step uh, progress, not perfection. But I also think there's something about, um, you can perfection something to death. And I think that people think that you have to make it perfect. Like you gotta get the semicolon just right. Um, and that's what matters. It's not, it's what, it's what, it's the visceralness of what someone says. When Bonnie Hammer says to me, oh, good deck. What that means is she gets, like she's seeing an image and she's seeing a text and she's comfortable that, that she wants to keep reading. I stop reading stuff within a page. Because I know if it's like the elevator pitch. You know if someone has put the time in to answer the questions in a way that I know is gonna be interesting. Which brings us, segue, to the next piece, pivoting. So here's the biggest problem with all of us in this room. We get so fixated on what, we're, what is important to us. Nope, this is it, this is it. Well, you can, you can own 50% of something or 100% of none. And the problem with going in very firm that this is the way to do it, this is how to do it, this is why to do it, means that you are instantly out of the running if you can't pivot. We were talking today, uh, jokingly, uh, you, know, you can go in and you did your research and they're all about dogs right now. 
they're doing scripted dog shows because they love pets. Pets are in right now and talking dogs and it's a thing. <laughs> and you go in and you have the deck and you go in and they're like, yeah, you know, but right before the deck, they're like, yeah, we hate dogs. We're just, they are not testing well. We just, we're over dogs. What are you going to do? Hamsters. Hamsters are in, right? But that's really it. I mean, the art of the pivot, it doesn't matter what you're selling. As actors, we all know that you have to be able to pivot in the room. You have to be able to read body language. You have to be able to read um, syntax. You have to be able to read and be able to say, ah, I got to adjust. The same thing is true if you're trying to sell an idea, even more so. Because if people are going to pay you to make something, they sure as heck better know that you understand what it is they're looking for. So all the research, everything I've just talked about, our whole last one and now, what this one line, one sentence means is, or not. And if you were here last time, you remember, if you, remember, if you know the why, then the pivot is possible. So that the what and the who and the where and the when could all kind of evolve and change because the why is still true. So to know your not why, know the purpose, or know th what the outcome is, regardless of some of the details that might or might right. test well, you can ditch those and get back to the why. Is all this making sense? Yes. 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 Hi. Just one quick question. Sure. sure. When you say pitch deck, are you talking about you go in, you turn the lights off, and you throw it off? Nope. Or, yeah, yes. Or you're, or you're either, lights rarely come off. So, but yes. <laughs> I mean, that's, Not anymore. Uh, that's nah. old Hollywood. <laughs> right. <laughs> Hashtag not anymore. <laughs> but yes, exactly that. It's whatever you're going to present, your presentation. Pitch deck is kind of just the colloquialism for it. And when in doubt, kiss. Not, not old Hollywood kiss. <laughs> what does kiss mean? Anyone? <laughs> And don't call me stupid. Um, <laughs> and, and, and this might go against everything we talked about, right? But it really, it doesn't. What I mean by this is keep it short and concise. The benefit of an elevator pitch when you're going who, what, when, where, why, you don't need to give them seven pages of diatribe on what the why is. Or, you know, or five, cent, five paragraphs with three bar charts on, on the effectiveness of this for their audience. There are things called appendix, if you really think that's important, but keep it simple, stupid. I would rather see a lot of empty space and a really cool picture that I can get behind versus just text. Yeah? Are you opposed to uh, like the Bible No, I, I, I'm not opposed to show Bible. Show Bibles are critically important if, we want, if, if you want some, someone to take you seriously. If you don't know what a show Bible is, we'll actually talk about that. Never. No, okay. Nope. So think For, about like trying to generate curiosity. Like you're trying to create engagement and, and even after the pitch, if someone has questions, you're better off, yeah. right? Because then you can start filling in the gaps that are relevant to the person that's pitching. If you're trying to answer all the questions with the pitch set, you're going to lose the majority of your audience because they, they didn't get to fill in the blanks themselves or create some curiosity. I had a, I had a uh, political candidate that I loved because when he first started, he, he gave out a book of like, this is everything I believe in. And I thought, that is so cool. Um, but that just gave people 200 pages of stuff to rip apart. Yep. And you want, yeah, you want to bait them. And, and that really is true because if you give everything up front, how are you going to follow up, right? People want to know what they want to know when they want to know it because otherwise it just sits on a, on a table. If you've ever been to your agent's office or you're walking through you know, William Morris and you look at the assistant, like the agents always have these gorgeously perfectly clean desks and the, and the assistants have these just piles of just crap. That's what you just sent. That's the, that's the Bible. So don't get it, don't do it in a place that they're just going to hand it to their assistant and walk away. You have to, you, you, like you want them to want more. Yeah, you're inspiring the first date. You create a profile that makes them want to meet you so you can begin the dating process. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> um, happily married. Oh, yeah. Is this, is this a hard copy or a I do, I, I never send something ahead of time. I, I will send a log line. I might send a part of a one sheet if I have to to get in the door. Um, but I never send something ahead of time. And I always say I'm going to send it electronically. Why? Mm -hmm. 
because that's part of the pivot. If you're in the room and you hear him say, you know, I really like, I, we, I, so Blueprint, when we were launching it, we had to create the brand. So we spent most of May creating the brand. And the brand colors, you know, all the fonts and all this. No one heard Bonnie Hammer, the head of NBC Universal Cable Group, tell us she hates green. No one heard that. Therefore, green is thoroughly throughout our whole deck. And she's like, <laughs> and like, we didn't pivot. So the best, because we came into the meeting to present her green. Um, and when, if we would have heard in a meeting, if we, in the pitch, we would have heard her say, I hate green. When we sent her that pitch deck as a hard copy, it would have been a different color. So I don't think, whatever you do in the room, you just tell them like, we have a draft version of this. We are gonna send you the clean version to incorporate your notes. And that gives you another reason to follow up. Um, visuals. You can only make a first impression once. You know, I don't know how many of you, probably you guys didn't, but we literally were back here going, should we wear a long sleeve know, shirt? So should we wear a coat? This one makes I, me We have a lot of, we have know. clothes <laughs> out back there. We are we're, actually, we might do a costume change. We're, we're going to have a, we're going to have a costume change because he steamed our clothes. So we got to go have a costume. But, um, but like literally, I mean, you guys all do this, you know, uh, what are you gonna wear in an audition? How's this gonna work? Same thing's true um, with like the visuals of a deck. People know if you're of caliber by the way it looks. Two pieces of paper with a uh, eight point, or you know, a 12 point ARIO font and, and uh, clip art, which is clearly clip art because it says Corbus across <laughs> it. <laughs> You're, you're not going to get that. You're not going to win. Just you're, unless it's the history of Corbus. And, yeah, right. Um, so the next thing on your deck, budgets. This kind of goes into your show Bible question. I'm a firm believer. It doesn't matter if it is scripted or non-scripted or what, you know, documentary. It doesn't matter. I'm a firm believer that you need to come in with a, a budget number in mind. But more importantly, what that budget number means. It's gonna be shot with two cameras. We're gonna shoot it this way. It's, you know, we can do this scrappy or it's, you know, to really do this right, we have to have X number of stages and it's gonna, you know, it's gonna take us this long because some of these are more complicated scenes to put together, but we've already talked to a, you know, to, to um, some stunt people and we already know exactly how this is gonna work. This is another one of those things like you might not know that. Budgets are something that I now know, unfortunately, but I sure as heck didn't but you know some of that does. Mm -hmm. All of us know a line producer. All of us know a unit production manager. Why? Because we do. And so ask someone else budget or research what budgets are. So when they say, how much is this gonna cost me? It's just like everything else we've talked about here. If you can't answer something, you're out. And I, th this is very practical, but I would also tell you, don't hide the budget in your, in your deck. <clears throat> you don't be ashamed of it. It's part of the story you're telling. It's the necessities and the idea and the stylistic, stylistic ideas that you have. So if you have a period piece, you need to be able to explain it's a period piece and what it costs, and the type of costuming, and type of expenses you want to put out there. That's part of your, the relevance to the, the, right. the, your pitch. Right. It doesn't mean you have to have a number, like a bold number and you know, that says, turn, turn. It's not an invoice. No. <laughs> no. Um, so here's the counterpoint to that, because we keep doing counterpoint. Oh, yes. Hi. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, again, that's part of the pivot. Okay. If it's going well, if the room's going well, go with the expensive one. <laughs> if the room's not going well, say, I could do it for a song. <laughs> and part of that is because it, it, it goes back to what's the purpose of this exercise as a whole? This is a good question to ask. Yeah. Are you doing this because you want to be rich and famous? Are you doing this because um, uh, you think it, like, this is your one shot? Are you doing this because this is a story you really want to tell? If it's a story you really want to tell, there's more than one way to tell that story. Mm -hmm. um, and, and again, I go back to what would you rather have, 50% of something or 100% of nothing? I don't mean that you give up. None of this is meant. Uh, pivot, budget, even you know, win simple, better. Like None of this is meant to say, don't be true to your convictions. IP is IP, but 
Like, there, you know, I guarantee you, um, in most films, until you get to a certain level, the writer of the film, there's a reason that a writer normally does their draft and then someone else comes in because someone has to then change it to make sense for the person that bought it. He who owns it gets to make the rules. So you have to be okay with that um, because very few of us are at a place where we can make it exactly like we want and know that, it, and then it gets seen. You can make it and then you can show it at, I don't know, your friend's house. But, it, but if you really want to do it right, by the way, we talked last time, there's nothing wrong with starting on YouTube. There's nothing wrong. I, have a lot, I take a lot of talent off of YouTube because you can see, are people engaging? You can see spikes. You can see when they're engaging, how they're engaging. You can see what their repeat is. I can find all kinds of analytics. And so I find a lot of people, I find a lot of IP off of, I found Chip and Joanna Gaines off of YouTube. So like, don't think you have to do a Scorsese That's right. if you want to get your concept across. Um, yeah. Sorry, do you, when you're getting people from YouTube, do you judge and weight the numbers more than or equal to the content or is sometimes the content that came and then maybe that I love that question. Thank you for asking that question. Did everyone hear that question? On YouTube, um, do you weight content and viewership equally? Um, I do not. I actually look at engagement more than I do numbers. Uh, art, numbers are so artificial. What do you mean by engagement? What I mean by engagement is how interactive that piece is. Are people responding? Are comments good? Are people sharing it? Like I can buy analytics and I can know how many people shared it. I can know how long people are watching. You know, that's the thing that people don't realize. Most people like, I, I have a, a, a show out right now. It's the biggest hit we've had. I just created, a, a, and again, remember, I, I'm, my network is all about empowering people to do, so it's very teachy. Um, it's fun ways for people to learn skills. So this one is a Broadway actress who is in London right now f doing a feature film that she will not tell me what it is. Um, I think it's Wonder Woman too, but. Um, or Star Wars. Star Wars. They, yeah, <laughs> I thought so, but it, I thought so, but it's not filming right now. So that's why I was like, mm. um, so uh, where was I? Oh, so her show for us is getting a forty percent completion rate per episode, meaning that forty percent of everybody that watched that show is watching it from beginning to end. That's the stuff, type of stuff I'm looking at. I'm looking to see are people clicking on and they're just staying on long enough and then they leave. Ten seconds on YouTube and it counts you. Those bots that go out to get numbers up, that's all they have to do. So I think that you know, good ideas are about how people resonate with them. And that's why I think digital is so cool for everything we're doing, scripted and non-scripted, because it's about testing, it's focus grouping resonance. The term resonate. I like to use is chemistry. Like there's something about it that you know that there's, um, a greater thing's gonna happen. There's sparks flying and that chemistry that comes from watching, watching engagement, watching viewership engagement, the chemistry that comes from that um, really is, it's almost unmeasurable, but it, you can understand, especially in the pitching process and the, and the ideation process, yeah. how that can play out in different variables. Yeah. Last one, and again, this was, let's do the counterpoint of that. When is simple better? When you're first starting out, like we talked about, you might not have the resources to do that. It doesn't mean you can't keep these same things together. Simple doesn't mean sloppy. Simple doesn't mean a lot of commas, no periods. Simple doesn't mean text them to death and they'll just give in. Um, simple means just streamline down what we're talking about here. You might not have a I, my, I have a deck, the deck that I had to present to Bonnie is 37 pages. And, um, and, and it actually, they were like, is this a short deck? And I was like, it's 37 pages, how is that short? Um, but uh, you don't have to do a 37 page deck. For how many, for how long is a show? It's a show that will be about $550,000 an episode with a minimum of 20. Um, you can, um, there's no rule that says you have to wait to get in the room with somebody before you share your pitch deck. Mm -hmm. 
you can uh, you can pitch your mom, you can pitch your friends, you can pitch your your pastor. You can start sharing this stuff, and you could A B test those ideas. I have two versions of it, and see what people respond to. So don't wait till the moment comes before you share. Some of this idea is working it out for yourself. Mm -hmm. The process is, is more important than the, than the outcome. And then know it well enough that you can share it and, and, and kind of gain some feedback from people that you know. Right. Um, and people in the industry and outside the industry is, are equally relevant to something like chemistry, like when you're looking at YouTube. So the way that Tim and I connected on this, one quick thing, and I'll tell you, the way that Tim and I, none of you are doing your question cards. We're doing that. <laughs> <laughs> totally, I'm telling totally it to you. Totally we're good, we're good. Hi, <laughs> kid. Um, uh, when Tim and I first met, uh, there was an instant chemistry related to the fact that, and I've talked about this last time, we are all in the same, like, we might all be in the same college because we do what we do, but we're not in the same fraternity, <laughs> right? And I always talk about this. People are like, oh, you're, a, you're an executive producer. Uh, you know, do you know so-and-so? I'm like, well, think of executive producers like doctors. There's a difference between a podiatrist and a brain surgeon. <laughs> I being reality television primarily or nonfiction, I'm kind of in the plastic surgery realm. Um, <laughs> thank you, here all day. Um, thank you. Um, but, but I mean, that's, but that's the reality. We all, there are a lot of people in our industry that have amazing ideas. It doesn't matter where you are in the industry, above the line, below the line, you might be producing trailers, you might be producing title sequences, you might be the accountant, you might be the actor, you might be the grip. All of us have ideas and ideas don't have to come from just that small little fraternity of people that we all hear from. Yeah. That's why we wanted to do this. You know, this is not, this is nothing we're saying here is brain surgery, nothing we're saying here, because I'm not that doctor, um, nothing you know, like, but this is all really practical information that I am, we, we, I'm, I love seeing hands come up. I love that I'm seeing people write. That's cool. We have some of it before you and then I'll go to, yeah. Since you're the king of pitch decks, do you post your pitch decks? I do, I do not. Because pitch decks, my pitch decks are all um, uh, IP of other companies. So when I create a pitch deck for a production company, it's their IP. So I was, I was uh, helping a company recently and uh, they got a call from a network and the call was, do you have anyone, do you have any drag queen ideas? And they're like, heck yeah we do. And they hang up the phone and they found their old pitch decks and they erased the couples <laughs> and put in the drag queens and pitched their and it's going right through the, so you don't share the idea because the pivot is like, what? we have a wedding show, why not drag queens in the wedding show and keep on going or whatever. It is. <laughs> so that's, uh, you hold on to that as an asset. You I did that, I did that show. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I, no I, I don't think there is. I think you need to give enough information that it's going to answer the question. I, I think you just made a great point. Good for you, you made a great point. <laughs> um, uh, I, in asking friends and focus grouping, because if as long as people have questions, you want to keep refining, but you don't want to then just keep making it like, oh, that's good, and I'll just add that. Well, then it just gets long. So it really depends on what you're doing. If I'm, like, for my film, it's a four-page... It's a four page pitch deck yeah. and it has, and then on top of that, kind of as layers, kind of like a budget to me is a layer. You don't lead with a budget, but if they want it, like, oh, I have the two, here's the slide. Um, I, I have full character breakdowns. I have, I, I basically have not a full Bible, but I, I have everything you need to know from set, what, what our set deck design is gonna look like to our character breakdowns to timeline to a rough shoot schedule that if they want it, I can feed it to them. Um, so like this 37 page deck, she was used to people that give every appendices. I just had all of my appendices in a different deck and I could just shut them together if she wanted it. I did an Evil Knievel show and it was 12 pages it was uh, about six or eight to begin with, and then we, as I shared it with friends and family, I had to explain to them over and over again, Evil Knievel did not die in the Snake River. So then I had to put a, a couple pages in there about how he didn't die, and he continued, <laughs> right? Like you start learning in the process, and it grows to that. But when you're pitching Evil Knievel, people already know the who. 
so you can get past some of the details in that. And that's what you start to learn when sharing with others. So, so we're going to do one, I'm going to do one last point that kind of relates to the pitch deck, and then we're going to take a quick break, yep. I think. Perfect. I, <laughs> code okay. is one, two, three, four, or two, three, four, five, depending on. <laughs> so for those of you here before, we talked about reverse engineering. This is kind of my secret sauce. This is the thing for me that it doesn't matter where you are in this industry, the way you fish the pocket to take out those note cards. Here we go. The way you fish the pocket is to reverse engineer it. And this is what this means. We talked about this before. So most of you know, the traditional content model is I have a great idea and I'm going to pitch it and then we'll figure the rest out. Right? And how many of those sell? Sadly, in the case of the proposal, it's too many. But um, <laughs> I'm going to keep it going all night. Um, but, but, the reali but the reality is that this is how most people pitch. When you go in, even if you have an elevator pitch that's the, the what, you still, you still haven't thought it through and you, haven't, you don't have your end goal in mind. The most important thing for most people is the what. What do I have, right? I have this IP. Well, there is no such thing as a new idea. You better be able to pivot. You better be able to keep it simple, stupid. You better be able to know who, what, when, where, why. So if all you care about is what, and you're gonna figure that out, chances are you're gonna be talking about this with your friends for years and years and years. And I would say get another hobby, and I can teach you a hobby at Blueprint if you wanna come over. <laughs> <laughs> but the reverse engineering model, um, this, this is, to me, in all business, all business, this is really the way that you go, that you fish that pocket. You look for that way to do something that's just uniquely different, that answers people's questions that they didn't even realize they had. Because everyone hears the same thing. I'm going to tell you this story. This is going to be the best story you've ever heard, and it's going to make you a million dollars. Okay, well, I've heard that before. So we believe you start with the why. Why is this important to who it is you're pitching? Because if it's not important to them, why are you there? Like, why do you go to Animal Planet if it's a show about, you know, um, uh, drag queens? Drag queens. Yeah. <laughs> I, that could probably well, work maybe. on Animal Planet. <laughs> animal Planet is not all just animals. So, right. um, but yeah, if you don't understand, like, so know your audience. Know what it is that people are trying to buy. If you're pitching it to someone, you're pitching to them for a reason. So what is in it for them? It's never what's in it for you. Go back to Lauren Michaels. If I'm the smartest man in the room, I'm in the wrong room. Mm. You are not the smartest person in a pitch, period. So all of us have to know how to check our ego at the door when you go into pitch because at the end of the day, you're pitching someone for a reason. That means they're the smartest person in the room. So you better know what it is they're looking for. What they're looking for is how to get to an audience. No one makes content, doesn't matter if it's scripted or non-scripted or documentary, it doesn't matter. No one's making content to sit on a shelf and languish. So you better know why they're making it, you better know who they're making it for, and then you better know how they're gonna distribute it. Is it front of paywall and free? Is it something that people are gonna, it, it's more blue chip? Is it something that people are gonna do because it's a really fun little side weird world that people really dig, but it's a very small amount of people? Doesn't mean it can't sell, but you better know that. Um, once you know all this, then you come up with a big idea. Because that big idea is a big idea that actually means something to someone versus just a big idea because you think it's a great idea. If I, I'll start where I began this. Today, someone told me an idea and I was able to pull the exact idea with the exact talent out of the thing. Because they had a great, they had a great idea and I'll figure it out. Well, so did five other people because this person is really in the news right now. Um, by the way, she would be pissed if she knew that all these people are pitching her without her. Because <laughs> she's um, pitching herself, probably. <laughs> yeah, and she, actually, she is pitching herself, too. So, so this, if, if, if this first hour that we've done, or hour or whatever, has learned, if you've learned anything, this is kind of where we want to stop this. Because this is, and there's more to come, but this is really, I think, the crux of what all of us need to do here. The same thing is true, by the way, when you go on an audition. Why are they doing it? Who are they doing it for? I mean, it sounds really obvious, but I know most of us don't do it every time. We forget that it's not about us, it's about them. And uh, 
I want to see, we want to see your big idea get out of your mind and go and become something. So, you know, do this stuff and you have a better chance. Okay, so we're going to take a break for about, uh, let's say 10 minutes. So take a 10. Tight 10. Well, which makes me look skinnier? That's the real question. This shirt or the one? <laughs> you thought we were kidding. We were not kidding. Wardrobe changes. So you, while, you, while you were out, let me recap. Oh, yeah. We, uh, Dan did the, the game of how far away people came from. Okay. And we had some like long drives. We had Palmdale, and then we got to Chicago, and then we got to D.C., and then we got to Florida. Oh, really? Who's from Florida? So you have the shortest drive to the Nappy uh, Conference in January, right? I do like Florida. Uh, somebody was talking to me before I left over there about um, uh, like what the third season, the third series is going or session is going to be about, and um, I was I, I was explaining to her, and I'll explain to you now because that's that's what the person we're talking about, <laughs> by the way. Uh, the intention of this three parts uh, session is to prepare you for the NAPI, or the idea is to prepare you for the NAPI conference. Uh, this is very specific about pitching because we want you to have a pitch deck ready to go in January. Um, but someone asked me, will we look at people's pitches? And I told them the bad news, Patrick does not accept pitches. <laughs> I don't want you to think he's available, he's here, Patrick is a consultant, he does help his consulting clients do pitches. Um, but specifically, uh, as much as we're available here tonight and we'd be happy to talk about that, when you're putting your pitches together, we're recommending you go find the right audience for the pitches. If you have something for Blueprint, sure, you know some of Blueprint, but it's not any more relevant for Patrick than it would be any other network or possibility or, or people you have that for. So we don't want you to think just because we, we talk shop that we actually are that influential. We're, we can't make you, <laughs> we can't we're not. your show to get on any network in any way. We're out there pitching ourselves and doing this stuff too. So just to put some details to it. I'd like you to spin that a little bit because <laughs> I think we're really pretty influential. Yeah, and, right. Uh, actually, um, no, if not. you do have a, a card or you want to have a card, please pass it over. This is my boy Seamus. He's sitting on the ground over there. You can uh, pass your cards to Seamus. He'll send it Seamus to us. Seamus steamed our clothes. <laughs> yes, That's and he why did. we had a costume change. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Seamus. Um, we're gonna, I'm going to sort through these, and we'll read the questions when we're done, the questions you have written here. Um, and then also, obviously, if they're relevant questions in the moment, we'd be happy to, uh, to keep them going as we're presenting. All right. Back so, to you, my friend. Well, thank you. So where do we leave you off? We left off that we want you to have a big idea. We want you to have that what, but we want you to be prepared for what that what is. Um, there's some great questions in here about like how do you know if you're prepared and all that. Well, a lot of this is this is this is um, art, not science. Um, I don't want anyone to walk away saying, well, this is the only way. There are as many ways to cook a burger as there is to do what we're doing here. You know that they're they're. Every chef says they have the right way to cook something, and strangely enough, they all cook it. So we, this is our way. But you know, I've, I've been really successful in mostly non-scripted, but some scripted. Um, I've been really successful in my uh, percentage of win-loss. Um, but on top of that, I'm a, I'm a student of this game, and I know what I think makes sense. It's really up to you to decide how this works for you, if it works for you. But if this doesn't find something, just don't do that, <laughs> right? Because you will never win. You will never, ever, 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 unless you're Mike Fleiss, win that game. <laughs> God, he's gonna hate or me. Mike. <laughs> yeah. No, I know, audience, Mike. Right? I know Mike. I know Mike. He, yeah. Hi. She knows Mike Fleiss. Yeah. Right there. My father. Huh. So. No, they already know that. The last thing I want someone to tell me is what my demographics are, because I know my demographics. I don't need you to tell me exactly who my audience is, but you better be able to understand their audience. So what I mean by that is, if you're going to go to Lifetime, do not have a script with a male character as the lead. Because they will say, do you know what Lifetime does? Um, 
Like that's a great example though of it's that simple. Like understand your audience. Don't regurgitate who they are because by, by the way, who you think they are because you read it in a magazine is not who they are because that's who they were when, they, when that article was written and that was old information then. Mm -hmm. um, we get mandates from all the networks, both scripted and non-scripted, what they're looking for. Um, we being your agents get them, uh, other networks get them, like we all know what everyone's looking for. Um, the second they say what they're looking for, it's out of date because they've already been, they're, they're saying we're looking for, we're looking for shows in the sci-fi magic genre for, you know, that's really kind of like adult, early adult lit. Well, that's because they already have two of those in, in development and they just want to hedge their bet, but they don't want a hundred of those because by the time, if two are successful, they've moved on. So that's, there's a lot of art versus science. Asking a lot of questions, know who they are by doing as much 360 research as you can. Who do you know that works there? Who do you know on LinkedIn? Like, hey, I, 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 you know, who do you know that can introduce you to the guy that can introduce you to someone that you can get some opinion on? You can also, this sounds really funny, but you can also just watch the commercials oh. on networks and it's clear who the audience is. So, and a lot of those commercial agencies. I love that, agencies, that's such a great thing. Yeah, a lot of those commercial agencies are locked in year after year. So you know that that same brand is gonna buy next year as they bought this year. And that's a funny way of looking at it. So you're not necessarily looking at the shows, but you're looking at who the market is by the commercials. Mm -hmm. Reverse engineering the thoughts. Yep. How much of this is driven by the ad sales um, as far as the demand that comes from uh, programming content? So the question, question was how much is it driven by ad sales? 150%. <laughs> because. Can you just explain ad sales yes. real fast? So yeah, so ad sales, those, so ad sales, ad sales is the network equivalent of ticket sales. Ad sales is if you are a linear television network or a cable television network, ad sales is the group that is selling that commercial time. Commercials. And the commercial time is where you make your money. I make my money because people subscribe. So Netflix, Hulu, myself, we make HBO stars, are, we make money off of people subscribing. So you, you make your money, which is basically the same as film, tickets, right? So it's either you're gonna have an influencer, an advertiser, um, which is a good segue because we're gonna talk about brand entertainment. Um, advertisers are either foot in the bill or the end, the end user's foot in the bill, but if at the end of the day, sadly, because ye who pays wins means that advertisers are running the show. And, and I'll say this though, the, it's interesting that what's happening now in the marketplace where traditional TV that we all grew up with was advertiser driven. Mm -hmm. Because of formats like Patrick, the objective is different. So the objective of advertising television is to get people to buy those products so the advertisers come back. So you drive an audience that makes a product. In Patrick's case, the objective is to have people not unsubscribe. Right. So to keep them subscribed. So it's just en enough relevant information so you don't unsubscribe to the service. That's, exactly. That's a very different objective than trying to get a, a huge audience that keeps on engaging moment after moment. And if you understand the trick of that and you're pitching out uh, a deck to one of those two platforms, you have to kind of think of what the objectives are, the financing is. You were, he was not a plant in getting us to brand and entertainment. But, <laughs> yes. um, Good segue. No, the, the, but the, 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 the end of the question was, um, is there communication from the agencies that are buying back to the network saying, look, at Procter & Gamble's in for $4 billion. If you provide them something like this, yeah, so we're getting very, we're getting granular uh, a little bit, but the, the question was, do agencies who control the brands then tell a network, we want this type of thing, because if you do that, they will pay? Absolutely. Uh, I, I, used to, I used to develop all the media, the visual content, so television content for Con and Ass magazines. And what that meant was they could get a, they could get uh, Chrysler or Procter & Gamble or Audi, um, those are three that I did them for, um, 
on the hook for more money if we can get them a television show on top. So then I, my job was to come up with that show, broker the deal with a network, so that the, the, at the end of the day, the ad agency that was brokering the deal with Chrysler got Chrysler to give us the money. Um, but that, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna strip a, a little of the granularness out because I think that this is something that everybody here needs to be thinking about because uh, everything old is new again. I Love Lucy was cigarettes and dish soap. And uh, we're back to a time where it's the exact same thing. What, the, what has been really interesting about the advent of everyone can be a producer means that brands no longer are loyal to CBS or Sony. Uh, the day of product placement where a brand would pay a movie millions of dollars to put their product in are over because they can get that same product on YouTube for nothing. Give it to an and influencer and it's done, right? It's done for a lot cheaper and you're going to get to actual people you really want. So now, so like that whole industry is kind of not fizzled out, but it's a very different world. Um, the same thing is true scripted or non. Um, brands are looking for ways to, content, to, to engage with audiences. And when I say brands, I'm not just talking Coca-Cola. I'm also talking about the local bank. Yeah. I'm also talking about the bodega. I'm talking about like, this is what we talked about when, we, when you start talking about like what's 50% or 50 of something or 100% of nothing. You might want to start by doing something on YouTube that you find the local brand that says, that's a really fun, cool idea. We've never done that. Can we put our logo at the end of it? Sure, of course you can. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I, am a, I am a student of content studios that brands are making. Brands no longer are even hiring production companies to do series. They're creating them all in-house. My favorite is Marriott. So Marriott has brand studios that are some of the most shrewd things I've ever seen. One, they have social content studios in, on five continents that are doing real-time engagement with people through GIFs and social media posts that are specifically targeted to individuals. That's how you get people to be engaged. They actually have teams of people that will do like little funny videos because they're seeing someone's comment about something. My favorite one was a couple was, uh, went to, I think it was Paris uh, for a uh, honeymoon. And they got to the room and they had an awful, they posted a photo of like this room sucks and you know, it was dirty. They started looking at their, at their Twitter feed where they posted, they're like, I can't tell you how sorry I am. We feel awful that this is your experience. This is your honeymoon. We should treat you different. They walked back into the room and there were flowers and there was candy and those people did a full on like five minute video on it that then went viral for them and they have loyalty for life and people like it changed their life. That sounds silly, it's not really what we're doing but it segues to so how do they make that into content? They do things like uh, a series called The Two Bellmen, which, and this is again, this is Marriott, right? This isn't Sony. And they had, they had, um, they did the first one at the JW Marriott downtown LA. The second one they did at the Twin to the Two Towers, the JW Two Towers in Dubai. And the third one they did in Seoul, South Korea. This, the first one had full-on fight, stunt fight scenes and dance scenes, and the, the hotel became a character. This is the difference today. The days of a product placement, the Coke uh, cup on American Idol, that's product placement. Where, why would you work to do your content at the local bank? Because maybe that bank can be a character in your show, in your idea, scripted or non. So now there's a benefit to them to give you the $1,000 that you need to make that piece of content. Because you thought about them first, the ROI. And you didn't treat them like, oh, I have to do the ubiquitous three shots of a logo. No, make them a character. Like, that's what Lucy's Cigarettes was a character. I own a, <clears throat> on the side, I own a zipline company. We sell backyard zipline kits. 
Um, I am always looking for content creators for our stuff. And, and I found them. We, we, we par uh, partnered with Treehouse Masters, and our zip lines are showed up every once in a while in Treehouse Masters. But even the latest piece was like a kid who wanted to film a water balloon fight. And it cost us, I gave the kid like $1,500, and he did his whole water balloon fight thing. It was just so great. And we just throw it on social media, and people get traction. Um, just the idea of like, here I am, I'm just a small brand, a couple million dollars a year business. We, it's a very niche audience, but someone had an idea, why not? Why not finance it and see what happens in social media? And that, that opportunity to do something really big, mm -hmm. like the Marriott thing, if you've watched Netflix, the Like Father movie that came out was financed by Carnival Cruise Lines. There's big, huge things like that, and there's small brands like mine, yep. where we can, uh, we're just looking for content, people that will talk about our brand, our work, put it out there and you're in neighborhoods all the all over the place that have ideas and products and pieces and they need marketing they need I, advertising I have a new sh series that's going to come out on uh, well it will come out next year on NBC Saturday mornings Saturday mornings they're all time by blocks if you watch all those educational shows they're all branded it's this um, so say time by block. So I'm gonna time by block means that this company, Litton Entertainment, actually bought the EI block, which is the must-carry educational television block on Saturday mornings, which used to be Scooby-Doo. Um, <laughs> how that was educational, not quite sure. Um, but, uh, but they bought these blocks from all the networks, and then they brokered the deals out. So every single one of those shows is brokered with a brand. One is a cruise lines, and the guy goes to all these different countries, and you learn about the country. So it's educational, and it's really fun. By the way, kids aren't watching it. The average age of a Saturday morning on NBC watching their shows is 24. Because <laughs> they're hungover, and there's nothing else on. But, but brands want that. Um, so I have a show that we're doing, and we're doing it with two brands. I haven't announced it yet, so I won't say the names of the brands. But it's Random Acts of Creative Kindness. And it's a whole show about empowering people to be creative, which is what my company sells, and be kind, which is what the, the brands that we're working with want. And by looking at what they want and what I want and reverse engineering into who's the audience that we're both looking for, what's the outcome both of those audiences want, hey, we should do this together. They're paying 100%. I'm a network and they're paying for the whole thing for us to put it on NBC. Um, and you know, again, this is at a higher level, but the, the reality is you don't, have to fi you don't have to go in the same door everyone's going in. Yeah. Right? This is what we're really trying to say is creativity can help you get your ideas out in ways that thinking like this is the way it's done can't. Um, brand sponsored versus self-distributed. We've talked a little bit about this. Brand sponsored. So I can pay for something and put it up on YouTube, or I, can, or I can work with a brand and they can put it up through their social media, which means that I'm getting paid reach. Um, knowing, you know, thinking through these things. No one's an expert in this. I'm not an expert in this. I just kind of wing it, and sometimes it works. Um, I, uh, there's, a, there's a rule of thumb that for every 10, well, for me, it's, it, but again, I do this with like staffs of people that help me do this. But for every 10 concepts I would come up with, I'd sell two to development. For every four I had in development, one would go to series. So it just looks at the odds. The more you can be flexible and think about all these different ways to skin the cat, the better likelihood you have that that thing you want to do can get made. It's all a crapshoot. Um, boy, it wasn't that depressing. Um, <laughs> um, uh, when, is, when, is con when is branded content a good move to make, a la I Love Lucy? When you have a brand that you can turn into a character, like we talked about, so they see synergy in, in working with you. Um, when can it hurt you? When you go into someone, and someone asked a question in one of the cards of, um, how do you know when you've done too much, when you've, you've, you've asked, too, you've said too much? Well, it's, the, it's when you go in and say, this is the perfect show for Coca-Cola, and the person says, I hate Coke. Yeah. It's what I told you, Bonnie Hammer hates green. Never picture green, by the way. Um, 
learning how to look for any finance, like the biggest thing for all of us in this room is none of us are wealthy enough to do this by ourselves or we wouldn't be in this room. I, we, we have to be looking at ways to do this, people to collaborate with. Um, you are not, you, we are not the smartest person in this room. Um, so look to your left, look to your right, start talking with people you know, start looking at how do you collaborate, how do you find people in your world that can help you get to where you want to go. So what, uh, one, one example I have of this is, um, it, you know, who would have imagined one of the largest sports marketing um, content creators is a Red Bull software, soft drink company, oh. right? So like they make in, this incredible sports videos with their brand showing up inside there. So you wouldn't have ever imagined if you're in the sports league, you think very kind of systematically or myopically through sports, you're gonna miss those, those opportunities. Yeah. Um, a lot of the stuff that we're trying to encourage you now is to recognize that the, the threshold of entry, the barrier of entry is now just disappeared. And the fact that you have an idea, we want you to be able to hear your own idea and imagine who that might be relevant to, and then feel free to pitch them. Um, it doesn't really matter if it shows up on a network or it shows up on YouTube, if it's showing up on someone's social media feed or it's being picked up for a Saturday morning event. Um, mm -hmm. All those are opportunities for you to be developing. And if you're gonna be a content creator professional, you have to keep on making content. It's not just the one idea. It's the, the fact that you can come up with ideas over and over and over again for a diverse market, for diverse means and diverse um, opportunities is the opportunity that you're looking for in becoming a professional. Mm -hmm. Many of us have the one idea. Um, but I like to say Spielberg made Jurassic Park before he made Schindler's List. You have to know that there's a market of people out there looking to buy and see things and just meet the marketplace first and then become a professional so that one story that you want to tell, you have an opportunity for that in the future. Just like the man who made the proposal is the one he was waiting for, Mike Lush. He just held on to that until he can finally do it. All comes back. <laughs> all comes back. But we just want you to think like a professional and act like a professional and know that there's more opportunity than just that one, one thing that we've grown up with, one thing that we've seen. It, the, the barrier is gone. Yep. It's just totally gone. And that means that the idea that you have, or uh, ideas you have, or the fact you can come up with an idea more important is the working professional in this marketplace. Yep. But because the barrier is gone means that the barrier of entry is gone which means everybody's doing it. Mm -hmm. So you, like, why are we trying to arm you with how to do a, right, a good pitch deck? Be, pitch deck? <laughs> Hashtag sorry. <laughs> um, how, it's because you're off, because everyone's trying to do it. Everyone thinks they're smart. Everyone thinks they're talented. Everyone has a good idea until you don't. And we all know the bad news in the room is, is that some dork is opening boxes on YouTube and getting six hours of viewing time by opening up boxes. And that doesn't even make any sense to us content, creative content creators, uh, but it is competition for the thing you're trying to do. It really is. It, it, I think I see a question back there. Oh, hi. Yeah, I did have a question. All right. So, so uh, in, the, in the pitch, the whole make pitch was the uh, who, what, when, where. Yeah. Is, is how The how, the how helps shape why, the how, oh, did everyone hear that? That was good projection. So I thought maybe everyone heard, but. They uh, did have to recapture it in the. Uh, uh, oh, the love, sorry, yeah, yeah. sorry. Uh, question was, um, who, what, when, where, why, how, is the how kind of the, the penultimate, is that the, the journey point? I would say yes, because how, how are you gonna make that? You're gonna make it, you, you're gonna have roller skating penguins uh, doing a cooking show. How are you going to do that? Like, I, I mean, bad example, but you know, how are you going to do? How like you're going to have you're going to have um, Picasso, old Picasso or new Picasso? Yeah, right. Because they're two people. How are you going to do that? No, because we're going to actually go back in time. The how is that hook, right? If you've 
It's kind of like every, anything else. If you keep them going like, uh-huh, and then what? Uh-huh, and then what? Uh-huh, and then what? The how is the how you're actually going to make it. Yeah. That they go, ooh, that's cool. It's the moment your creative energy gets to be pulled into this thing. Because the other elements are more systematically the reality of what you have to go against in the business. But the how moment is that creative spark that you have and who and how you get to show your genius in the marketplace. So that's the moment where that's truly up to you to pitch the how part of it. So I'll, 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 I'll give you a personal example of when the how was really important. So with Fixer Upper, um, uh, we shot a tape with them, great family. We were like, this is it. This, this family is going to make a gazillion dollars. And we showed the tape and no one got it. And no one got it. And no one got it. I had to pitch that show eight times. And finally, I, was, I had a network executive from HGTV. We were at a focus group in Vegas. Awful place to focus group, by the way. Um, and, um, and, we were, and, we were, and we were waiting for a, group, a new group to come in. I said, I really want to show you something. And I was able to tell her the how. And she goes, that's cool. Why didn't you show that in your tape? And I said, because we didn't, like, uh, long story. But she gave us $5,000 to go write and make a new tape. And we made the tape that was able to really prove the how. And people were like, duh. So that's, that is another segue. But it's also a, a good example of the how is what separates you from the other 18 people that have your same idea. That's right. Um, but that brings us to our last provocative topic of the night, to sizzle or not to sizzle. This asks, are you going to show tape or are you just going to do paper? Um, uh, yeah, could you just, I know that you and I know what a sizzle reel is, but yeah. maybe you can just give an idea of a format of what sure. a sizzle might sizzle be. Sure. Sizzle reel can be one of a couple things. A sizzle reel can be a teaser. A sizzle reel can be a mood tape. A sizzle reel can be a snippet of a show. A sizzle reel can be a, any kind of um, visual representation of what you're going to do that's going to lock them in. To make him go done. Um, With the drag queens, they called it a chemistry test, and they had the the four drag queens talking to one another. That was the sizzle. It got you into the moment. What what they might be like. What it might be like on TV. If this is a if this is a I I have a friend that did a really cool sci-fi project, um, and they had to do it on a really really amazing budget. So they had a they had a two part sizzle reel. The first part were mood boards set to this just really ominous music um, with narration that just kind of imagined a world. And it was literally just the pitch deck with a really cool voiceover. And then they did they actually put in twenty seconds of the scare. So you're in the middle of this thing. Imagine this world where you're da, 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 and all of a sudden. Every room just um, and that was to show them that they understood timing and they understood pacing. And it also said, oh, by the way, that's exactly how we're going to do it in the movie. Um, I don't know if he sold that movie, but I just thought that was so cool. Um, so the sizzle is what you're going to do that kind of seals the deal. Um, I love sizzles too. Like I have a, one editor that's like my sizzle go-to guy. And I just, I, I, I'll watch the sizzles and I cry. And I'm like, oh, it's so good. Um, so good investment versus bad investment. If, if you can do a sizzle reel that really proves your point cheaply, that's a good investment. If, and by the way, there's a thing called a rip sizzle, and it literally means rip it off. Because when you're pitching in a room, it's not being broadcast on television. So you can use any song you want, you can take any piece of content off of the internet. You can take anything from a movie because it's all about how you're representing. Hold on one sec. It's all about how you're representing the, um, the idea. I have a, a colleague of mine that used to work with me and now she runs a network. And she, all, every single sizzle she ever did had to have like five, she thought it was very important. She had like had a five uh, uh, groundbreaking movie snippets in it, 
And I was like, God, you're just, all you're doing is ripping off other people's stuff. Like, there's nothing original. She goes, no, the originality is people want to see which movies I put in my sizzles. <laughs> <laughs> she has sold more shows than anyone I know. So she definitely wasn't wrong. But a sizzle, if, if the sizzle, if showing the, the sexy, and the sizzle is also, you know, like that, that old adage, all steak, all sizzle, no steak. That's where the sizzle comes from. If the sizzle is that, that smell, that flavor, that texture that's gonna get them over the edge. If you can do that and you can do it in a way that you can feel good about and you can afford, that's a good sizzle. I have a client, uh, I have a client through my consulting company who um, is a Jap Japanese, Japanese company and they got conned into doing proof of concept sizzles for six different ideas, because they said, well, people need to, you know, crazy Japanese game shows, you have to show them the actual game show. So we're gonna have to do full pilots as our sizzle tapes. So they spent seven figures to do these sizzle tapes, not one of those sold. So that's a bad investment. <laughs> Good investment helps sell the show. Bad investment doesn't help sell the show. But it's also, if you, if you need to like shoot a short to sell your idea, your idea isn't very good. Yeah, it's not very well thought out. And, and uh, I think we're trying to really break in your mind the idea of being a content professional mm -hmm. and what it means to do this constantly. You can't be investing $10,000 into every idea that you have you would go broke before you sold an idea. Amen. But what does it take to advance your ideas in a marketplace so that at some point, if it's really good, someone might give you five grand to try a sizzle or a chemistry test right. or, or some, kind of oper some kind of a vision look. Or those, all those pieces are things that evolve into it. Right. There are moments where sometimes words aren't enough and you just want to capture it. And if you know you can do it, give it a shot. If you, if, you, if you can't do it and you know you need it, that's where you're, hi you're hiring someone and paying somebody else, you might just want a, couple, a second opinion before you start paying others to do it. Right. Um, you had a question. Uh, no, I was going to say, there's a bunch of Ripomatics on YouTube if people want to check them out. Yeah. So the, the comment was, there's a bunch of Ripomatics that you can see on YouTube. Absolutely, like Rip Sizzle or Ripomatic, you'll see it. It, like, um, you'll... I think you actually see some of ours. Uh, what happens when you rip off a ripomatic? Is it a? <laughs> <laughs> it's a reverse. It's a, um, um, you age in reverse. Um, so a couple of things on this: rip versus shoot. Like the, I think especially when you're first in this game, don't try to shoot something to prove a point because chances are you're not going to do it as pretty as people want to see it. If you're going to a brand. Ad agencies have, uh, are notorious for spending vastly too much money because it has to be shot on film. Um, no, it doesn't, A. <laughs> and um, and I, can, I can guarantee you I can do that for 10th the price. And Tim and I talk to clients all the time about like, convince them that you don't have to spend that kind of money, get the, get the business. Um, and, uh, and when you're pitching a show, they want to know that you understand quality. If you're shooting it, it's not a good enough quality, you're, you're not really proving how your eye and your, and your ability to high, find high quality. So they'd rather see that you've looked at something exactly. of better quality and brought it in as a reference than try to shoot yourself and lower the quality. Um, I, I, we, talked about, we talked about a talent reel. Sometimes the talent reel works really well. Like all I wanna see is the talent. And, and we, you hear from network executives, not from me, but from other network executives, you'll hear, I just need to see a Skype. Just send me a Skype. That's what we did with Chip and Joanna Gaines, and it didn't sell eight times. Because people said, I just want to see a Skype. Well, no, not everybody gets it. A Skype, like you record a Skype interview. Not everybody gets it. Some people say they want a certain thing. You need to know when you think it's ready to show someone. Don't do it because they say, just send me a Skype, because guess what? I have the ability to go back in eight times. You don't. And I didn't really either. I, I mean, I was pressed my luck. Um, Graphics, to graphic or not graphic. Graphics, when you start talking about how you're gonna spend your money, graphics start to get really expensive. Um, again, it's so much better to like keep it simple stupid. Less is sometimes more. A nice card, a black card with white text that just fades up. Anyone that does iMovie can make a fade. Um, like that's so much more 
effective than to try to do you know, crazy graphics if you don't know how to do this stuff because it does get very expensive and people know if you're trying too hard. Right? Keep, keep it simple, stupid. And when, when enough is too much, this is the last point on this. Um, it's the same thing we talked about with the deck. If you overdo, if you overthink, if you over verbose, um, you actually do yourself a disservice. One of the cards, um, and when we're going to go to questions now, um, one of the cards asked the question, uh, I'm paraphrasing, um, can, can you ever give too much? Absolutely. This is why I, we've said, like, have a, have a deck, read the room, tell them what they want to know, follow up with that next step that's a little bigger. Don't, like, walk in with your Bible. Don't walk in, like, you know, don't produce a whole pilot um, because the more you show, the more they can poke holes in. I mean, that's really the thing. Like, give enough that they go, you, you got it, I trust you, but not so much that they go, yeah, I don't really like that thing. And we've all done that. Uh, I don't like, I really liked your performance, I just, it's your hair. <laughs> <laughs> I'll wear a wig. Nah, it's too late, it's already in my head. <laughs> yeah. Sizzle should be, uh, my rule of thumb is no more than three minutes, but, but, but that rule of thumb is just as easily broken. I think a sizzle needs to be as long as it needs to be to make sense. You can create a mood in 20 seconds. Mm -hmm. You could show a clip, like if you want people to get emotional and get in that sad place, show a clip from, you know, This Is Us or, you know, Little House in the Prairie for God's sakes, I don't know. but like. <laughs> Like, show something that's gonna get people in the mood. That can be 20 seconds, that can be, it's not six minutes, for sure. This is another place where it's addition by subtraction. Make sure you're getting to the point, explaining what's there, use the moment, use the emotions of music, voiceover, things that are easy to come across, and um, try not to, you don't have to show it all in picture if you have music, sound effects, voiceover, and sometimes right. graphics, you can cut through many, many minutes of uh, trying to show it practically. Right. So, recap. Um, how to win, uh, oh, hello. Oh, this is what we're doing next time. Hi. <laughs> uh, so, once you've done a pitch, you gotta know how to win the pitch, right? How to talk in a room, how to sell yourself. Um, we spent two things to know the market, know yourself, know the pitch. Now we got to get you in the room to sell. Um, so that's what we're going to do next time. Uh, yeah? I'm raising my hand preemptively because I knew that the next slide was going to be Q&A. Oh, where'd it go? The question that I had was not the same question I wrote on my card. Sure. Okay. So I want you to give your, your final statement. I was just preemptively raising my hand so that I can go ask you. I love it. <laughs> Done. No, go. What's your question? Uh, Here, do you want to recap before we go to Q&A? Uh, yeah, sure. Okay, recap. I gotta look at this. Yeah. I gotta do it with You glasses. actually wrote it down. <laughs> um, all right. So, first thing is you cannot sell if you cannot tell, right? You have to be able to tell your story, and you have to be able to tell your story in a way that doesn't appeal to you, but appeals to them. That is the first and foremost rule. Um, once you have the kernel of your idea, you gotta learn how to show it off. You gotta water that kernel, and you gotta make it into a flower. And so that's really what your pitch needs to be. Your pitch, no one wants to see a seed, people want to see the flower. So you need to be able to put your best foot forward to make sure that what someone's seeing is the very best of what you want it to be, even better than it's actually gonna be. But that doesn't mean be a perfectionist. Nope. Um, <laughs> that's all I'm gonna say about that. <laughs> We're recapping, come on. Uh, it was good, no, it was really good. Um, Think about whether or not you want to sizzle. Think about, think about the extent to what you want to do. Keep it, sometimes the best thing you can do is keep it simple and let the pitch, let the idea really shine. But you have to know that the, the audience is, those that are giving out their money or their distribution need to see that you actually have put in the effort and know what you're doing and that you're the right one to go with. Because you're not the only one that's pitching it you're not the only one that has a good idea, and they have, even Netflix, well maybe not Netflix, everyone else has a finite amount of money on how much they're <laughs> um, 
And then if you, and then a last thing I'll, I'll say is, if you have an idea and you're in the middle of this process, start, as Tim said, start talking to other people. Like let other people be your soundboard. Uh, you know, the, I am my own worst enemy. I self-edit, I self-everything. Um, start listening to other people because you might say this is the best thing since sliced bread and if three people say, I don't get it, then you're not gonna sell it. So you might as well figure out how to get it, right? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay, so it is nine o'clock. Oh. Um, but we have like zillions of cards. This is yours, by the way. Can we go like 10 minutes over? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Woo. We're here all night, don't worry. Um, we will. So what I'm going to do is uh, people have written questions, and it's possible the questions you have in the audience are already written on these magic cards. We'll go through the cards first. We'll kind of do like a speed round of answering these questions. Speed round. Um, if there are follow-up questions to what we're saying, please feel free to throw them out there, especially if it's your card and we didn't understand what you asked the first time. Um, you know, some of you need some penmanship lessons. I just want to. <laughs> I know I gave you the hard to read questions, by the way. I don't have my glasses, so it's all right. Here we go. Uh, do you want to borrow mine? Uh, we can go off and back and forth if you want. Um, what software do you use for your pitch deck? I use Keynote. Uh, super simple thing. It's Mac products. Keynote. Why? Because it's the easiest one for formatting photos if you don't know Photoshop. Um, and also, I could say it doesn't matter. Microsoft Word works the same. Just change it to landscape instead of portrait to make it easy on you. Yeah. But you're looking for pretty. That's what yeah. you're looking for. So Power. if you understand how it works, you're better off doing it than trying to learn a piece of software to get yeah. your pitch out the door. Yeah. I mean, but, you for yeah. Any of those? Agreed. Your turn. Or are you just? Gonna, gonna, oh, I'm you're gonna, 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 no, 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 no. I, I okay. got one for you. Uh, all right, uh, go. When is an NDA needed in the pitching process, or is it necessary at all? Uh, so NDAs, NDAs kind of go two different ways. If I am receiving, if I am giving What's an NDA? Uh, non-disclosure agreement. So a non-disclosure agreement would be, um, I'm about ready to tell you a secret. I don't want you to go around and steal my idea and tell it to others. The, uh, the mis idea behind NDA is that you're the only person with that idea. And if you have an NDA, then no one else will f find it. Right. That's not true. And we're trying to kind of prove that with the pitch has these how, what, where, when, why. That's what's necessary more than it is the idea that it has a non-disclosure to it. This because is what, there's always. Well, others. and this is why we're talking about like if you have IP, if it's all, like, like I could have signed an NDA to see this pitch today, but I literally saw that same pitch from someone else that did not have an NDA. And I, didn't, and I could just steal it because it's clearly not IP if they're both pitching the exact same thing. So, and I know we've been saying IP all night. When we say IP, we mean intellectual property. It means something that you own that is intellectual. It's not conceived right. of. So it's an idea is a piece of intellectual property, an actor or a right to an actor's history or life, that might be an intellectual property. A book. Uh, so the question was, when do you NDA and when do you not? So I have this series that I'm greenlining that is, you know, like $500,000 an episode, and I'm vetting it out to production companies right now to see which production company I'm going to work with. I'm going to have them all do an NDA because at the end of the day, it's my idea and not their idea. NDAs are to protect you, but it also, you have to think about who you need to sign the NDA. If you're pitching a network, you do not need them. The network is not going to sign your NDA. You, you sign theirs. So up, NDAs work downhill, not so well uphill. And if you own the intellectual property, the, uh, the NDA is not required because you own the thing that you're pitching. Right. They can't go steal right. it from you. you all right. Hold, uh, is that a specific question? It's a follow-up. Yeah. yeah. Is it at all worthwhile to trademark or copyright your ideas before you go into pitching? Yes. Okay. Uh, it depends on what it is. Uh, I think in... Uh, is it, the question was, is it good to trademark or copyright or you know, do a writer's guild? Um, I, I always did. I don't as much anymore for a couple of reasons. Now it's you know, a lot of what you do when you start doing this for a business is speed to market and you just keep going. So I don't necessarily have to. If it's something that I'm investing in, it's a script or something, that script is going to be copywritten. I want to make sure that like, yeah. But like, the film that I'm shopping right now is actually the story of my son's birth, which was quite dramatic. And, uh, and like, 
I'm not worried about someone taking it because it's mine. And by the way, I have a New York Times article and other things, so I'm covered. But so it kind of depends. All right, go. Oh, um, how do you feel about creating pitches with um, actor intent letters and actor references for roles and visual? Um, I think I think it's fine to p say I want you know so and so to play this role or in the om but I I'm one that's much more about in the homage of because it kind of I had a slide about Coke or no Coke. Um, if you say I really see this as like a Kate Blanchett and they, ugh, Hate kid budget. <laughs> You're done. So the whole idea of the whole idea of pivot is important in your pitch decks. If you're going to show characters, you're showing the types of characters. A, you can't guarantee you can get Kate Blanchett. So take that off the table. B, someone might not like Kate Blanchett. But if you're trying to say, I'm looking for, I, I'm a big believer in threes. So if you're showing three different people, and between those three, you can paint a picture. The other reason is then you can pivot. If, they, if you start to see something, you can kind of weave the story to your advantage. And we'll talk about that in the next, we'll talk about that in the next. And one. we're saying this with confidence in this room, but there are clearly moments where you should have that actor intent in place. But in most cases, that actor already has their own production company and yeah. they already have their intent. So most likely with the person asking the question here, it's not necessary. It's your idea, the concept, and you, you're selling yourself and your ability to do it mm -hmm. uh, more than you're selling your connections. Um, this person wrote, I wrote and produced a film that has an offer for distribution. That's I awesome. want to pitch that concept, IP, as a show, but most distributors require, quote, all the rights. Is there any way to protect the IP and do what I have to choose in a medium like TV before it goes to film production? Uh, hmm. I, it's very complex. I do think that more and more people are, I mean, like people will say all media in perpetuity and, you know, you'll get that. Um, Again, it really depends on how much they're paying. If you're willing to put some of your own money in, you can probably save some of those rights. But if someone's paying, footing the bill for the whole thing, then they're not gonna be willing to give up something else. And I'll change the answer a little bit too. If you came up with one idea that sold, why not just make up a new idea that sells? That's how a professional works. You already have one in the works, Craig. Like make answer. 17 more <laughs> than try to repurpose the same that you have. All right. If we've done our homework and know which exec we would like to, uh, uh, the, would like, know which exec would like the pilot, how does one get the pilot to the exec without a lit agent? How does one find the lit agent? Okay. So we did this last time too. Um, uh, you got to look more than just going through an agent. Agents, like an agency, an ad agency, these are all gatekeepers. Their job is to keep you out. They don't know you. They don't care about you. You're not going to make them money. I'm just being honest. Like you need to look. If you really have something to sell, look for other routes. You know, fish the pocket, not the stream, because the the biggest impediment to you getting something done is an agent, including your own agent. <laughs> it's 100% true. So, uh, you know, my a I had an agent for many years that I didn't realize really wasn't working for me. They were working for themselves, and um, they were thwarting me doing this one thing because it would have lost money on the thing I was already working on that was making the money. So, and I don't mean that disparage agents. I have several agents in my family, but. I think that the reality is don't, you, 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 if you want to get to someone, you have to find a different way in that, through someone that's going to say, vouch for you. An agent's not going to vouch for you. What are your thoughts for content creators and writers regarding the format like New TV by, I think it's oh, Wonder Co. and Jeffrey Katzenberg? So I don't know New yet. I mean, it's, it's new. But it's, I think the thing with new is it's going to be super buzzy and it's going to mean it's only celebrities. They're not going to go, you know, Netflix is just now getting into nonfiction and reality because now they have the market that wants it. But Netflix didn't, you know, Netflix still makes its money off of celebrities. Um, so new is going to be, you don't want to be the first one into the trough at new because they're not going to come to you. They're going to go to Kobe, like they just signed a new, just signed a deal with Kobe Bryant's company. You know, they're going to go with buzzy people doing buzzy things. So don't, again, don't, don't look for the shiny penny. You know, yeah. my, my, fa my favorite thing in Up is squirrel. Like, don't, <laughs> don't look for the squirrel. And I think too many people in this business, like, do that. Like, what's new? What's the shiny thing? Yeah. Everyone wants that same it shiny thing. It is exciting. It is 
something that has more opportunity because it's undefined. It seems like it's easy to get into. All those are great ways of looking at it. And I like the fact that you're questioning the marketplace and wondering what's there. What, we're, what we know is that you oh, are successful with something you already know more than you can be successful with something you don't know. Right. So just know and have confidence in that. Did you have a follow-up follow question? Yeah, follow-up. Yeah, follow yeah, uh, follow my question. I'm yeah. sorry if I get to follow up quick. Yeah. Um, so yeah, ex excellent point, Patrick. Like Wonder Co. and New TV, they have financing through all the major studios. So obviously, mm -hmm. none of us in this room is probably going to get a show yeah. on that thing. But I wanted to see if you guys could read the tea leaves. Do you see more opportunity coming up at premium type short form content rather than I want to make a 30 minute hour long show yes for short form is the short form is the future people's attention spans are downing and downing and downing so like um, content in my squirrel um, content in my <laughs> educational content like like I want to learn to do stuff used to be two to four hours of content broken into 20 minute pieces no one finishes that I mean, the, the completion rate's like 3%. So I've already cut that down to less than 10 minutes an episode um, and, and not have it that you have to have, you have to finish episode one to do episode two to episode three. All of them have to be separate. So everything is shrinking down. Premium content is like, so there's also a, there's also a fine line. Premium content is not two minutes. There is zero value in a two minute anything. That is all free content. You can get that shit, excuse me, everywhere. And that's really important. If you want to sell, if you want to create because you just love the art of creating, create something small. That's awesome. If you want to do it for a business, look for where the premium is, and that is eight minutes or more. Um, in digital, two minutes or less, six to 12, 22 plus. Those are the frameworks. So, two minutes or less, that's what you see on Tastemade and Buzz, you know, BuzzFeed and all those, two, like Magic Hands videos, all day long, little kitten videos, all day long. Um, six to 12, that's the sweet spot for digital, um, and that people are willing to pay for, and then over 22, which is series. I, I would say too, in reading the tea leaves, Katzenberg is clearly a person that's used to owning mm, a platform. Mm. So the fact that Katzenberg is seeing something in the future, I think what that means is, is the people used to controlling a platform are trying to get rid of the, the garbage, all the chatter, all the noise, and try to find some kind of idea of premium and select that they can then control again. But I'll give you so a there is something that's happening in that space that's creating that control that the world is. So I'll give you an example in my world, to. masterclass, educational, like there, it's, it's the ultimate premium. They're, they're drowning. They, have, they're, they are hemorrhaging money because they're spending a si serious amount of cash and they have 36 of those. And if you went there to see Serena Williams, you probably don't care about uh, Alice Waters, right? Like you don't, so yeah, she's a chef. Um, but like, so I, the problem is you can overthink premium. A lot of things have come and gone in the premium space, a lot. And uh, it's, it's, it's a fine line. Anyway. All right, next question. Um, is there a difference between pitching a TV show and a feature? The answer is yes. They're usually a bit different in size, but also who you're pitching to. A feature film is a very select group of, a group of people. There's usually a bunch of uh, an acronyms around feature films that you're there. When we're talking about TV show or TV show content, we're talking about that kind of more common uh, accessibility like you're seeing on social media, like you're seeing on um, devices you have at home. A feature film really is, there's a big, huge idea of a blockbuster uh, money and game and desire game, and that all that is a, just, a, just a different world and different finances. We didn't touch anything on, on that today. Yeah, for I sure it's I, different. It's it's a, it's, it, is a, it is a much harder world. Okay, um, if there's a set, this is one that I'm like, penmanship people? Not really, it's good penmanship, but I just can't read it. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, if there is a saturation in the marketplace for your genre or similar shows, films, would you consider that great or awful? I think that's such a great question. I, my boss right now said, we gotta get into beauty. People want beauty. I'm like, the top six people on YouTube are all beauty people. Like, 
He's like, yeah, that means it's good. I'm like, no, that means it's awful. That means that it is a very segmented market. It means that there's a lot of competition. It means that everybody is looking for that same shiny penny and going into that. If you have a genre, this is truly what I do a lot. If I have a genre that feels tapped out, I have a series that I brought over from um, a client in Thailand. You're I'm, not good at this speed round thing, by the way. I know. Everything's in terms of two minute story. Sorry, I can't help it. <laughs> I, have a client, I have a client from Thailand. They, we had this idea, we pitched the idea. No one wants the idea. It's, it doesn't mean the idea is bad, it just means that we're gonna hold it. You gotta be patient. In your ideas. Just okay, move on. Faster doesn't mean you're actually speed running. No, I'm just kidding. You are uh, not very fun to work with at times. <laughs> I see Dan over there. He's Dan, hungry. I'm what sorry, you Dan. Pizza thing? Yeah, I'm cool. I only have one more card. How? Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How do you do your research and find out what network is looking for at the moment, following up the idea of the reverse engineering? Uh, so you can find all kinds of things. You can find articles about like uh, what you know. What are the upfronts? What do they just pitch? Upfronts is the most important thing if you're trying to go traditional media, scripted and non, because the upfronts is when they pitch. Uh, no, it's when networks pitch advertisers. So to the point, want to know who's most important? They're going to spend a lot of money pitching those advertisers so you can find out what they want there. Yeah. And, and upfronts happen twice a year. Yeah, so if you pay attention to the upfronts, again, it, that's a big event a network is putting on to show the content they're making for the year to get advertisers interested in that content so that they spend the money. I can do this one really short. Yep. Do produ are producers turned off by a very fleshed out idea? Not necessarily, but again, the more you give them, the more they can poke holes. So there's a fine line between I gave them enough to make them feel uh, you know, to make them want more versus I gave them so much that they're gonna be like, eh, I'm tired of that. <laughs> I'm gonna paraphrase this a little bit. Uh, regarding the idea of a budget, do you actually put a number in the deck, an actual number, and then how much detail do you go into? Like single camera shoot, 10 locations? Yeah, I don't can. put that in the deck. I, I can reference it. You need to know that like, you can be able to pivot and they say, well, how much is this gonna cost? Roughly this. But we can also do it this way and it's going to be a lot less or a lot more. Um, but you know, I want to hear from you what you want and then I'm going to follow up and show you a budget. Huh? They're short. If you read that one, I can't read that one. All right. Um, oh, geez. My eyes are not good. Reverse engineering, do you mean this sequence to be used as part of the deck presentation? Um, you can use this in the deck. We, um, this is a word like, well, yes and no. You can see, you, don't be so literal as to say, we know this is the return you want, we know this is the audience you want. We know, like, they don't, again, they don't want you to tell them what they know, they know what they know better than you, but you sh can use those words. Like if you know what their return, if you see 25 articles that say what they're looking for, weave that in somehow. They, they would like that, that they look like you did your homework yep. and you're trying to approach them with the objectives they have out in the marketplace. They, uh, they very much like that. All right, last one. Do you have any suggestions for someone that has a pitch deck and series Bible pilot for uh, getting in the room? Do you have to have an agent? We did this one. Um, I, you want to go with whoever's going to get you in that's going to vouch for you. Um, no one likes a cold call. Uh, those very rarely go anywhere. So you start doing, part of your homework is networking. LinkedIn is your best friend. As much as people think it's lame, it's awesome. Uh, uh, are there any other questions that we have in the room? Oh, Maybe geez. Three, four? Okay, we'll All start. Right. We'll do these three. Hi. Um, Hi. As someone who doesn't have tons of experience in selling shows, um, how, do you have any advice for how to um, like get something sold with you attached to it in some way if you can just like buy it and then be like, okay, it's someone else will do this thing. So the question is, if uh, not having that much experience, what's the kind of breakthrough of and difference of pitching a show that you are specifically attached as talent or creative, or an idea that anyone else could be attached to it? How'd I do? Uh, so I, I think it's you have to be willing to not be attached to it if you want to see it done. Um, I, I'm a big believer, I pitch it, I've pitched it to friends in this room, that sometimes the best thing you can do is partner with someone that has the name that's better than yours that can help make it get done. It doesn't mean you don't have a role because if you pitch it, that means that you're, it's your idea which means you're gonna make money off of it. And sometimes it's about making money and being able to have that credit and say, oh yeah, that was mine. They go, that was yours? Yeah, I, that was my idea. Oh, that's cool. So uh, sometimes again, you have to look at it as, is it an end in itself or a means to the next thing? 
And remember, ideas are free. You only have to just think of them, so you can keep on coming up with more after that one's done. What's the other question? Uh, two more questions, right? Who right there. Yes. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. right way. Um, when you were talking about Jesse Katzenberg and the whole platform and you were saying, oh, the shiny new thing, Kobe's got a deal, right? My experience at least has been that a lot of people who have huge names, like like Steph Curry just got a deal. You know, like there's a lot of people who are right, like, brand. Ron obviously has deals, but they're not filmmakers, right? Tim Tebow's got a deal. They part, yeah, they have, but, but they, they, they start, per, uh, this is, people can have, you know, you have these big names, but they're not, Creatives, right? But they hire creatives. Right. And like I was up for a job at, at a, I, I was up at a job to run a uh, the shingle of a uh, sports person. Right. And, and I was going to say, and to be clear, to to recognize the people that you're bringing up, they're people that we brought up with Kobe Bryant or or uh, Seth Curry. They are the brand. So when we talk right. about branded content, you're making content for that person that is the brand. Yeah. So I know that person's a brand in that case, but to make content that's relevant for their audience, for their marketplace, whatever, question. that's probably. Yeah, so, thank you. so sure. basically where I was going with that was, as far as you identifying people with whom to work or collaborate, I guess my question is, in that particular situation, it seems like you would be able to pick those companies with content that they would know. Well, I, no, the question was, can you, so if you're, if, you can't get to Jeffrey Katzenberg. Can you go to people like Kobe Bryant that are pitching him? Yes, you can, but everybody's trying to get to Kobe yeah. right now. And you know, think about who Kobe has in his circle. He knows every celebrity. He knows every filmmaker. He knows everyone because he's Kobe yeah. Bryant. So therefore, he has the cream of the crop of who he's already working with. You know, Kobe won an Academy Award last year for a short. Kobe Bryant won an Academy Award. It was a cool short. It was a really, really cool short. He financed it. Yeah. He's the money. Yeah. So why did he win? Because he is the money. And he found the right person that knew how to do it. If you can get to an uh, influencer that is like trying to get into this and they haven't figured it out, good for you. Yeah, I really I. encourage you to do that because you've just, heard, you've just gone three steps this way without having to be Mike Fleiss. Had to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> we had one more, we had one more question. I think it, Hold on, hold on one second. I just want to get this other one. When you're talking about pivoting the pitch deck and you said you're the king of pitch deck, do you have several decks that would work for one project and you could just, like, if you feel like it's not working and you thought it was, you say, well, what about yep. this? So, so this question, and by the way, this is the woman who optioned a film. She really uh, wants to know because she, she really wants to know because she now needs to pitch that film. Um, so the question was, do you have more than one version of a pitch deck? Absolutely. I don't necessarily have more than one version, but I have more than one slide type of slide, and I rearrange the slides depending on who I'm going with. The the big slides, though, the salient points stay the same. Who, what, when, where, why is the same. It, how you pitch it. You, again, you might, if you're pitching it to a, like my husband does uh, uh, marketing for all the studios. All, like, so when you see a trailer and you go, this is the best movie ever, and then you see the movie and you hate the movie, blame him. Um, <laughs> but his, but um, you know, they literally will go like, what's the difference for a trailer on Lifetime versus A&E? Same network group, but totally different audiences. So understanding that you might have a blue pitch deck versus a black, like I have my, my uh, core pitch deck, I have a white version, meaning it's a white background because I want people to be able to print it out. And I have the dark background because it looks better on a screen. Okay, so it seems like that. Well, right, guys. Yeah, we're going to uh, cut this because we've yeah. been told let we are uh, way do you want to, before you get off stage here, and we we'll, one more. We'll, we'll give you guys a chance to say thanks to type. You want to tease session three just a little bit? Yeah, well, yeah and you want to? Do you have a date for session three? No, we do not yet. Just stay tuned to uh, all your usual channels that you found out about here. And of course, since we have your email addresses, we'll let you all know when it comes up. So I'm going to cover two things. One, uh, we do have an next session. It is going to be in, in the last quarter of the year. And again, it's the last step in preparation for the Miami event in January. Um, what we want you to know now that you have the pieces together is what it's like actually in the room. So what's the deal like? How do you know what, when to make a deal? What, what's a good deal? What's a bad deal? How, what those final deal elements are. So when it's coming back to you in form, how do you know those pieces and parts? So we want to give you the business insight of that actual deal. 
And let me give you one last piece of encouragement because you're all gonna go have pizza together or you're gonna go pitch. And it's a very simple idea, but I want you to think of it like this. Um, a friend of mine recently was talking about um, these, these fine artists that he's working with. And he asked them, hey, what are you working on? And the person says, I'm working on this piece it's, I'm, and then I'm working and I'm gonna put it in my, in my show. And if he asks them next year, they'll say, I'm working on this piece, it's for my show. And again, and over and over again, he asked the same person, the same question. They're always talking about what they're working on in the moment and how that's gonna to apply to the one thing they're gonna do with it. When he has the fine artist, goes and tells people, they say, what are you working on? And he's like, well, my idea is, in the future, I wanna paint a lobby of a hotel. And I saw this thing at Art Babel, and I wanna be involved in that in the future. And I even was thinking about what this other person's approaching, and my hope is to someday approach this. And he says, when you add the future into the conversation, people say, oh, I know someone from Mercedes-Benz. Maybe I can introduce you to them. Oh, you have that really good idea. I can get you into that lobby. Or I own a lobby, maybe you can do it. So you're about ready to go have a conversation. If all you're gonna say is, I'm working on this show, I'm trying to get it on air, nobody can come alongside you. Mm -hmm. But if you talk about the idea and the approach of where you're going to go, now the pitch makes sense. Now your ideas make sense. And you have to be able to be vulnerable and share your dreams. But in that moment, others can be joined with you. And that's what networking is about. This guy's so smart. <laughs> All right. So, gentlemen, stellar. Thank you, stuff. Again, thanks very much, first of all, to all of you for making this real. We, I certainly, on behalf of you guys, on behalf of NatP, on behalf of the SAG After Foundation, we think this is valuable IP. Thank you. And yeah. we're glad that you were here to share it. So again, thanks to Dennis and his team. Thanks to the NatP team. One more time, Tim Thompson, Patrick Jager.